Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor seateth, sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Just one announcement to make before I uh, we go any further. Anybody with mobile phones, could you please switch them off now? Unless you're on, unless you're on call for a hospital or anything of that nature, which I don't think any of you are. One, one young lady on the front said, oh, I'll switch that off now. There's one going already. <laughs> we'll start by singing hymn number, uh, I better look what I've got down. 558, 558, oh for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free, a heart that always feels the blood so freely shed for me. Charles Wesley, I don't know whether you've ever heard of him before, but he knew how to write hymns, I think, didn't he? He knew all about it. He knew about the way of salvation and everything. Put it in a hymn and make it into a sermon. Come in, folks. It's all right, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right. It's all right. Come in, come in, come in. Come in. We'll come to the Lord in prayer now then, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we do thank thee for this great privilege that is ours this afternoon, to come and worship the God of heaven, the God of glory, the God that sent a wonderful Redeemer in our Lord Jesus Christ, that sent his Holy Spirit to be our guide and our leader, our comforter. Throughout these times, Lord, we just thank thee and praise thee. We thank thee for the precious blood of Christ that keeps us and cleanses us. We praise thee for these many things, 
We praise thee for one another, Lord, that we, that we can come and encourage one another in this most holy faith. And we thank thee that it is a holy faith. We see the world going here and there and every which way. We've seen them just outside here not long ago, loading on a bus to go and watch 22 men running up and down after a bag of wind. And Father, we are here to worship and praise the living God, things that will take us into a glorious eternity. We pray for our brother Paul, that thou bless him his ministry immensely this afternoon. We pray, Lord, also for Daniel as he gives us a word. And we pray, Lord, that we'll, we've come with our hearts open to receive from thyself and that we shall go home blessed, refreshed, strengthened in Christ and strengthened in one another. We ask these prayers in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Um, I just want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank the, our friends from Leicester, Brother Paul Bassett, for Daniel, and for Scott, uh, Sonny, that they brought with him this afternoon. A young man, he'll probably talk to you after and tell you all about his Christian faith. Um, for Chris, for doing whatever he's doing up the back. And he's going to do something for us tonight. Uh, there's an offering box there, and one there, little blacken. If you want to put anything in, you can do, you're not obliged to. We don't do go around with a bag or anything. Um, toilets are through there. Um, at the back there, there's a table with some books on. If you want them, just take them. They're free. There's, tr there's uh, tracts. There's uh, bookmarks. And I've been told to say there's calendars. Yes, I've got it. I've got it. <laughs> I haven't had to have a prompt. Uh, and then after the meeting, there'll be food. And there's plenty, so eat well. Feast on what Brother Bassett's got to say first, and then, then eat well. Right, Daniel, are you up for it? Would you like to hear the need to be turned up a bit? Yeah. Okay. Because it's not very clear, it's very important. Need more volume? Yeah. yeah. From above yeah. and below. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been told most of my life that I've got a loud mouth, so might not. <laughs> might not be an issue at the moment but um it was it's great to see you all again uh, this afternoon it's always our privilege it's actually one of the highlights of our year if we were honest um to come here and to see you all and and i've been i've been so encouraged already by some of our sisters that have said to me you know every every tuesday evening um we have a bible study and every week without fail we pray for you and for Pastor Bassett as you go out into the streets on a Tuesday. And, and you know, that kind of thing, I, I really pray sometimes and wish that your generation could live, you know, for as long as men like Moses, you know, for 120 years. Uh, because, you know, especially the elderly saints here, you're a, you're a dying generation and I, you know, and I, and I love your generation for so many reasons. And, your prayers are just as important as the people that actually stand and share the gospel, you know, and on being on the front line, as it were. But your prayers are just as important. And this is the reason why we're blessed every week. It's because of people and saints like you uh, in this room. So we don't take that for granted. So I won't keep you for very long. Um, but just an, an update. Uh, every week we go out... Um, we always, Pastor Bassett and I, we sit in, in, in my car and we park just outside uh, what I think is still actually the largest outdoor market in the UK, uh, in Leicester, fruit and veg market. And that's where we park on a Tuesday night. And we always pray and we say to the Lord, Lord, you prepare the people. You prepare the people's hearts to hear your word. This is your work. These are your gifts that you have given to us. This is your word. And it's in your strength that we come out. So without thee, O oh God, we can do nothing. Um, and he answers our prayers every week. And yours also, of course. Um, I met a man recently from a place that you've all heard of. Um, it was from Damascus. I've never met anybody from Damascus before. Um, and he stood there with his two daughters. And he was fluent. His first language was Arabic. 
uh, but his English was very, very good, uh, and he understood everything, and, uh, and he heard the gospel for the first time in his life, and uh, his daughters just remained silent, but they listened intently, and his question to me after hearing the gospel for the first time was this, and these are his words. He said to me, what book can I read so that I can know Jesus Christ? I mean, I, I, I can't remember his name, but I, whenever I pray for these men, I say, Lord, you know their names. You know, you know how many hairs are on their heads. Um, they're created in your image and in your likeness. You know who this man is and his daughters. Um, and I went away thinking, how wonderful would it be if he asks the same question as the Apostle Paul asked on the road to Damascus? Who art thou, Lord? And what an amazing thing if the Lord Jesus replies to this man from Damascus with the same first three words that Christ replies with in Acts chapter 9, verse 5. Just three words, but how powerful are these words? I am Jesus. I am Jesus. So let's pray that this man comes before God, wanting to know who Jesus Christ is, and he comes before Christ and he asks the question, Who art thou, Lord? And may he find that answer from the lips of Christ himself, I am Jesus. And may he know him as his saviour and as his redeemer. So that's one man to pray for. Um, another, another one you can pray for uh, is this, and this is very fresh. This is actually this morning. I received a, a text message this morning um, as I was getting my car washed, actually. And it was from a chap that I met about a month ago, and he was from Saudi Arabia. And his name is, a bit of a mouthful, his name is Abu Abdullah. And he'd never heard the gospel before. He's from Saudi Arabia. And I think I shared this with you last time, that there are now a hundred churches in Saudi Arabia, all underground, obviously. There are a hundred churches now. There are a hundred congregations of people, of men and women and, and children that come to worship the true God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and who know the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, not the Christ of Islam, the Jesus of the Bible. A hundred congregations. And this was a country where, where no churches existed, even as far as 50 years ago. But God has been doing a work in that country and in the lives of people from Saudi Arabia. And forgive me if I've shared this with you before, but I sat with a man um, a, a few times over a few weeks and I gave him an Arabic Bible years ago. And he was from Saudi Arabia. And I went through the scriptures with him and I gave him a, a, a Bible in Arabic and he actually took that back to his own country. And you know sometimes, and we don't hear voices in our heads, but sometimes we have confirmation in our hearts from the Holy Spirit that God has done something in that person's life. Don't, do you feel that sometimes when you share the gospel with a person? And although they might not say anything, we just know, don't we? We know from the Lord that God has clearly prepared this person to hear his word. And he's basically on their case, as I like to say. Um, and this was, he was one of those men. And when I hear stories about churches being planted in Saudi Arabia and, and thousands of people being converted to Christ where the gospel was once banned, I often think, what about that chap that we spoke to in Leicester who took an Arabic Bible, who took it back to his own country? Maybe he was a link in the chain through these people in Saudi Arabia. I might be wrong, but as I often say to my dear pastor and friend, the day will declare it. The day is going to declare it. One day Jesus Christ is coming back and he's going to reap the harvest that he has sown. It's his harvest. And he's coming back to reap that harvest, the harvest that he's sown. But back to this man who messaged me this morning, Abu Abdullah. He messaged me this morning to say that he wants to meet me again. And he said, I, I want to sit with you. We'll sit in a, in a cafe. We'll sit in a coffee shop in town, which is, which is great. Um, and my practice with him, God willing will be the same as I do with anybody from the Islamic world who, who wants to hear more about Christ. I will sit there in a coffee shop, I will buy him coffee, I will have a Bible open on one side of the table, and I will take him through small sections of the Old Testament. I'll take him into Genesis 22 with the 
um, with Abraham and his offering of Isaac. I'll take him into Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 that speak about the sufferings of Christ. And then I'll take him into the New Testament. That's, that's my practice. And that, the reason that's my practice is not because anybody's told me to do that, but because when I read the New Testament, Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul reasoned with the religious people of their day from what? From the Scriptures. But they didn't have the New Testament. They reasoned with them, with the Jewish people, from the Scriptures, which meant that Paul would have opened the Old Testament Scriptures and Jesus Christ himself opened the Old Testament scriptures and, he, and they reasoned with these religious people to say look, Jesus Christ here he is, this is the Messiah, this is the saviour of the world, this is the one who the prophets promised would come and live and die and rise again um, so God willing pray for him as well, Abu Abdullah um, who messaged me this morning, so that's really fresh um, and I'll just end with this um, one of the verses from one of my favourite hymns from my favourite century in history is the 18th century, The Great Awakening. If you've never read The Lives of George Whitfield, who is a friend of Charles Wesley, who's already had a mention today, but Whitfield needs a mention now. Um, there was another man, William Williams, and he's often remembered for writing hymns, and he was a very gifted hymn writer, but he was also a very great preacher, a very powerful preacher, a very anointed preacher. Uh, and a wonderful man of God. And he wrote a hymn, and one of the verses in that hymn says, Fly abroad, thou mighty gospel. Win and conquer, and never cease. And may thy lasting wide dominion multiply and still increase. Sway thy scepter, sway thy scepter, saviour all the world around. The gospel is going to the ends of the earth including places outside Arabia. And it's because of your prayers. This is God's work, but you're his people. And you're interceding at the throne for God's servants who go out and share the gospel. Keep doing it, because your prayers are as important as the ones that actually go out and speak the truth. But go out yourself. Go out yourself. God is willing to use you. Are you willing to be used by God? Thank you very much, Daniel. That's a fresh update. If you've had one from this morning, can you hear me any better now? Yeah. Can you hear me any better? Yeah. Is that any better? Yeah, very good. Right, we're just going to sing again before our brother comes, and Daniel's just led us into it. It's on about prayer, and it's a, a wonderful hymn by Josie Scriven. What a friend we have in Jesus, 509.
let's just pray together. Our prayer, Lord, is simply this. Sir, we would see Jesus. Amen. The message that God has given me for you and for me this afternoon is to be a man or a woman of one thing, be a person of one thing. We live in a very complicated world and it's man that makes it complicated but simplicity is one of the attributes of God. He is single and one and that is something very marvellous and that should be reflected in the life of every true Christian. We haven't got time for any more. Time is so short, whether we be young or old. We need to be a person of, of, of one thing. Let me read some of the opening of the 27th Psalm. And you'll see here that David, David who committed such terrible immorality and godlessness, but he is described as a man after God's own heart. And uh, the 27th Psalm is wonderful. Let me just read the opening of it, emphasizing the point that David was a man of one thing. He could say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. In, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell, though an host should encamp against me. My heart shall not fear, though war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord in the day, all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Even standing here, I remember going to uh, preach in a large church in Bath and I had no message from God. Uh, it got to Hoppus nine in the morning. I got so frantic that when I went down to breakfast, I hoped that somebody would say something on the Sunday morning breakfast which would guide me to the text. But no word came. And I got on my knees, desperate, before leaving to go and preach on nothing. And God led me to this psalm. And I had a letter. I was preaching there on the Monday as well. And I had a letter um, on the, before I left from a lady who had been in a work near Bath in a village like some of you come from. And it had been shattered. The work had been finished. And she felt finished. And the Lord told her to come to this church where I was preaching. And God, she literally heard these things. One thing shall I have a desire of the Lord. That will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And, and, and he'd given her these words miles away in, in a part of, uh, of Somerset and she was amazingly blessed and uplifted and carried on when she felt like giving up. Felt like giving up lately. Old, my friend David, I don't know him personally, but David Wilkinson said that. Felt like giving up lately. But it's wonderful to, to be here and I feel a great responsibility. I still am not well and the nights are dreadful. And a night or two ago, I, I was convinced I wouldn't be here. I'm not saying I'd be dead. I'd be alive in heaven. But I felt that I wouldn't be fit enough to come. And already he didn't know it. I thought, well, Daniel can preach instead of me. But the Lord has brought Daniel and the Lord has brought me. But to be a man, a woman of one thing. I love, I love the end of this psalm, incidentally. If you look in the authorised version, which is the greatest version, and verse 13, when words are not in the original Hebrew, 
the Greek for that matter, but in the Old Testament, of course, Hebrew, they're put in lighter print, which we call italics. And if you noticed, in verse 13, it says, I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. The Jews had a construction which went like this. The, the word, I had fainted, insults God. Both Calvin and Spurgeon, I remember reading this many years ago, they said, throw out the words. They're not there. They've been put in by the translators with the intention of giving us to understand the sense. But of course, they're, they're not right. A man cannot believe in God and faint. Impossible. You see, men ought always to pray, it says, doesn't it, from memory, Luke 18, 1, men ought always to pray. And what's the opposite to praying? Not praying, no. The opposite to praying is not not praying. The opposite to praying is fainting. And how wonderful it is you can't believe and faint at the same time. So this is the emphasis and this is the, the thrust of the words. The word is unless, not fainting, unless I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You see here were David's two great weapons. The weapon of God-given faith and the weapon of God-given hope. Unless I believe, that's faith. To see is the future. That is hope. And you know, you never have hope before faith. Impossible. Uh, hope is the fruit of faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence, the conviction of things not seen. Now that's straight from God. It's not here. <laughs> I have no notes. But that didn't come in my meditation. I meditated on this for many nights and early mornings. But how wonderful the emphasis is. Unless... I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land. Ah, oh, you may say, what would become of me? And you may be in that state this afternoon. What would become of me? But how wonderful it is that we are told, wait on the Lord. You know, I have a bad heart condition. And in July 2015, as you know, I died twice in a day. My wife has got far greater faith. She was there the first time. I knew you wouldn't die, darling, she said. <laughs> that wasn't hope, that was faith. And she went home. And then I died a second time. And then you remember the word he gave me, uh, Psalm 118, Mr. Singer, who'd been brought up in the free church, came to tell me he was right and he was wrong. It is in Psalm 118, but he came straight from the God of Psalm 118. In the night, I had those words. I shall not die, but live to declare the works of the Lord. That's why I'm here today, to declare the works of the Lord. And... Uh, it may be that you're a backslidden Christian. It may be you're, you're a nominal Christian, a Christian in name only. God can save this afternoon. God can restore this afternoon. Will there not revive us again in the midst of the years? And in wrath, remember mercy. So it says here, wait on the Lord. These concluding words. Be of good courage. <laughs> I know this. And he shall strengthen thy heart. My heart is permanently damaged, but, but I have, with, in India, my church, don't get me wrong, they planned a prayer meeting in a week's time, and I had a phone call, a letter from Jins and Guthrie, the director of funeral direction. It's not about me, a, a certain funeral I'm going to take next week. But you see, the Indians went to prayer immediately. They fell on their knees at three in the morning, don't take our father. Don't take our father. That's why I'm here this afternoon preaching. But here is the key. To be a person of one thing. And in that fourth verse, David says, One thing have I desired of the Lord. But you know, it's possible to desire things of the Lord and not seek them. Just fade away, just sort of stop. It's good to desire things, but it's not sufficient. It is insufficient. We have to seek our desires. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. How wonderful. All the days of my life. You know, we shouldn't be people of one day or this. All the days of my life. Why does, what is this one thing? It is to behold the beauty of the Lord. 
and to inquire in his temple. Men ought always to pray, we heard just now, and not to faint. You know, in, one, in, in, uh, in Philippians 4 it says, you know, be anxious for nothing. Literally it's in the imperative. Stop worrying. Stop worrying. I inherited a worrying nature. It may not appear to you, but my mother was a worrier. And when I came in at night, I used to say, what are you listing? And she was listing all the things she feared the next day. And I inherit that. It's nothing to do with faith or God. Don't come and preach to me afterwards. It's my nature, my fallen nature. But thank God, you see, he's bigger than that. In Philippians 4, it says, uh, stop worrying in everything by prayer and supplication. Let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And I have the picture of Paul in prison in Rome and the Roman centurion, the guard, the sentry, walking up and down as you do as a sentry, up and down. And he suddenly realised the peace of God is guarding my heart. The peace of God in this building this afternoon, may it be in your heart and mind, is walking up and down. Nothing to fear when God is, is guarding is guarding your heart. And that's the secret. Oh, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to pray, to inquire in, in, his, in his temple. And then you'll know those truths that I closed with, not here, but the end of the psalm, unless, that's the key word, I'd believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land. What would become of us? And we may feel that in our churches. Some of you have five or six people and you only need two or three sick and one or two in hospital and another goes to glory and it seems it'll soon be over and I'll be realistic. There's no future, is it, humanly speaking? There's not a young generation coming back. If I was a young person again or as a young married man, I'd go not to church where all the young people are. I'd go where the old people are. But the trouble is when we're young, we haven't got the wisdom that we have when we're older, the wisdom of God. And oh, to know that, to know where God wants you. I remember a girl, a lovely girl in my church called Diana, and she went out into Pakistan in that area when things were terrible, wicked. And uh, I said to her, she was leaving my study, oh, Diana, by the way, you're going to the safest place in the world. And she looked at me as if I was bonkers. Is, is there been so much bloodshed? I said, I tell you what, Diana, and it was fresh to me that moment, and just now. I tell you where the safest place in the world is, is where God wants you to be. You could choose a place with all roses around the doors, and you can retire and stop all worrying. All the I've got more problems. I'm, uh, called, they call it retired. Well, I retired, as far as I'm concerned, are things that go around the wheel of a car. But I, mean, I, don't, I have more problems than I've ever had. I have a house that is in a terrible condition. I've already spent thousands on it. and I'm to, I, My darling wife looks after all that side. I'm not into that business. I'm not into it, but, you know, it's just... And I'm not asking for an offering this afternoon for Paul Bassett to have. God will provide, but it's, it's the wrong end of life at 86 I am. It's the wrong end of life to have to deal with all that nonsense, you see. Most of life is spent with property and problems and possessions. But I remember a Cockney. A, ch a Cockney is someone in London East End who can hear bow bells. If you can hear the bells of the church, bow bells, then you're a Cockney. And they were there. And this chap was a believer, a tough nut. And you know what that is. So see me afterwards. But if you don't, but I'm a tough nut. But he said, you know what, what he, 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 he says? People matter more than things. It's worth repeating, isn't it? I'm not leaving God out of the picture, but here we're comparing people and we say, most of our life we don't spend with people, with things. People don't worry, it's, not, it's things that get in the way. And how, what a wise man he was, that tough Cockney Christian. People matter more than things. So here this afternoon, the first thing is to be a man or woman of, of one thing. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. And he's a wonderful word. He beautifies the meek. He doesn't beautify the proud, but God beautifies 
the meek. One of the most wonderful things is to be a preacher. I've got to go and speak on October the 10th. Remember it. Put it down in your think tank if you can remember it. Um, these Americans, they want to use me as long as they've got me. And they've only met me once. But I preach to them down. I think Daniel was there, weren't you? In Droitwich, where they've come. The opening of the new session. And they want this oldie to come and preach. They've given me quite a long time. They said there's a lecture for two hours. <coughs> In my place, I can't even get in five minutes, but two hours. And they said, if you want, you can go further. And that would be something. So, you know, you may hear, he's been preaching for three days, and he said, it could be, you see, could be. <coughs> People like Rollins, you see, and, da and William Williams. My wife is related to William Williams. She's related. He, he was, as Daniel said, an incredible preacher. He's remembered for his great hymn writing. But he was converted to Hal Harris, and he was an amazing, amazing uh, preacher. Well, that's what they want me to do, to give a message, to give a lecture. I don't like lectures. I think that's the curse of Bible colleges. Lecturers create lecturers. We need, you know, we need preachers, and we need preachers, and they're very rare. Uh, I would think we've had five or six preachers in Melbourne Hall, not with Sid Bassett. They finished me off on the 31st of December 19, uh, 2016, but very few preachers, uh, about six. And the, the last one happened to be myself. Uh, I preached at a funeral, and well, I thought the roof was going to come off. I could hardly move with the presence of God, you see. But this was a godly woman. And all her family were unconverted. West Indians, oh, they must be Christian. No, just nominal Christians. Not saved. They don't know the blood of the Lamb of God. They don't know what it is to be born of God. And Oh, I, I, I get to nights. I dread the nights. My breathing gets so strong. I nearly die. I tell God, I can't go. I tell you what, there's not, it's not Paul Bassett. There are not many out there of men and of, of one thing, you see. And no wonder Paul says in Romans 10, how shall they hear without a preacher? And that was in New Testament times. How shall they hear? Many readers, many lecturers and talkers, but very few preachers. God send us a new generation of preachers and Christ is the greatest preacher of them all. One thing have I desired, to hold the beauty of the Lord and Quinius Temple. And then if you turn, another example, if you turn to Luke's Gospel, Luke was an amazing person. He was a historian. You notice how he begins his Gospel. This is just, this is a bit of extra for you this afternoon. You won't have to pay any more, but the extra. Listen how he begins his Gospel. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. And you know, he had the privilege, in spite of God, of writing the opening of the Acts of the Apostles. I remember Lloyd-Jones saying, he was quite right, it, it's not the Acts of the Apostles, it's the Acts of Jesus Christ. Because if you ever notice the beginning of, 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 of Acts, um, you, you'll see, and my page is torn to shreds, I don't think I can read it. This former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to, to do, and to do only what Jesus, in the Acts of the Apostles, all that Jesus, he began to do and to teach. Thank God for the, the things of teachings of Christ, but the doings of Christ. We have got to know they're equal. They're both divine. The doings of God and the teachings of God. And all that Jesus began both to do uh, and, and to teach, and this is him. But here, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, this historian and evangelist Luke, if you turn with me to the, uh, the, tenth, uh, the tenth chapter, uh, 
You're still staying with this idea of being a person of, 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 one, of one thing. It's, um, yes, here it is. I'm reading from um, the 38th verse of Luke 10. Now it came to pass as they went and entered into a certain village. That's relevant. You've got certain villages. God knows your village. A certain village, and are you that certain woman or that certain man whose name, Martha, received him into a house? And she had a sister called, uh, which was called Mary, that sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. And Martha was cumbered about with much serving and, and came and said, Lord, dost thou not care? What an insult to God. Cast all your cares upon him. Why? For he careth for you. You know, we live, we've, we've had to create care, haven't we? We have to have carers and all the rest of it. Isn't it incredible? Our fathers and forefathers had no carers. They just did it, didn't they? The next door neighbour came in and gave his last bit of bread. We've lost that. We have to have official carers. It's an insult to, to humanity, the state we're in, you see. We got used to it. And he says, she said, do, 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 Lord, do you not care? That Martha says that my sister, this is verse 40, isn't it, of uh, Luke 10, that my sister has left me to serve alone. Bid her, therefore, that she helped me. And Jesus answered and said unto Martha, Martha, thou art not caring, thou art careful and troubled about many things. I wonder is that where you are this afternoon? You can hardly concentrate because of this has happened this week or that's going to happen next week or whatever. Thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Now people say, oh, I'm a Mary. And others say, I'm a Martha. No, no. We should be both. There's times when we are Martha. We're not to be cumbered about with much serving, but we are to serve. And there's other times when, like Mary, we lay aside our work and everything else, whether farming or whatever, Oh, who will do it? If we don't do this, what will happen to the animals? Of course, we've got to be relevant and we've got to be realistic and we've got to care for the things that we're trusted with. But do you ever sit at the feet of Jesus? What Daniel said was true. When I had, had my heart attack, Jesus became precious to me. In a way, he'd never been. I'd been converted on the uh, 10 to 2 on Monday 13th of August, 1956. My life has changed in a moment. I went back to the same officers and had tea with them, but I wasn't the same man. And, and when I left the Air Force, you, when you go into, into London from our place, you pass the of Hendon. It's a museum now. Well, I wasn't a museum piece. I was there, it wasn't. I used to lecture there. And this chat like Churchill, he had medals from his third chin down to his waist. And I went in to ask him, could we have a Billy Graham film? But being a coward, I said, uh, sir, I want to give some lectures on the atomic bomb. And, said, oh, yes. and I said, going from one foot to another, there's one thing I want to say. I said, uh, can, will you give me permission to have a man to speak on, on God in, my, in this station? And Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay, Clay or both, he slumped back in his chair, and he looked at me, and I thought, this is your lot, this is your number up now. And he said, Bassett? I said, I'm standing here, sir? And he said, Bassett, I wish I had more Christian officers like you. And that's what he said when he left the Air Force. But that day he said to me, you can have any man you want in working hours to come onto this station and speak about God. You, you, when you're a man of one thing, God will trust you. And as I say, when I left the Air Force, he, he called me in. And when he left the Air Force, he called me and said, Bassett, 
I say to the glory of God. I wish I had more officers like you, you see. Fear him, you saints, and you will have nothing else to fear. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What fools we are. Fear the Lord this afternoon. Come back to him. In, in every one of us, there's a degree of backsliding. We're not the man, the woman that we should be. But how wonderful. Yes, be a, a Mary, a, be a Martha at times. We're meant to, not to be anxious about these things, but we are meant to work. And at other times, we agree to that one thing which is, is necessary, one thing needful. There's many things we want, but God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. What a God! What a Saviour, you see. If I wasn't saved this afternoon, I would be praising God at this moment. And some have lost the love they had. And some have never loved thee well. Where are you this afternoon? Restore unto me the years that the locusts have eaten. I've seen locusts. Not long before I came back from Aden, I was up on the Yemen border, and if they'd come, they'd have wiped us out. We only had a few machine guns. But, but I can remember the locusts coming. Not many people have seen locusts. It made a 747 like an old tiger moth, just a little plane. The noise was phenomenal. And all the tents where we were, we were up in the, the, the mountains, just 40 of us. I was the only officer. And they were covered. Our tents were covered with locusts. And when locusts move on, there's nothing left. And you know, even as believers, not to unbelievers, to believers this afternoon, the years that the locusts have eaten, they've eaten away our vigour. They've e eaten away our singleness of mind to be that man and woman of one thing. Whether it be like David to behold the beauty of the Lord, or like Mary, that one thing needful to sit at the feet of Jesus and be taught of him. One further example is in Paul writing to the Philippians. You remember how he got into Philippi? He was over there in Asia. And he tried to go into, you read of this later in, the, in Acts, in the 16th chapter, just listen. He tried to go into Mysia. And that's an amazing thing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't just constrain, moves us, but the Holy Spirit stops us, stops us, restrains us. And he tried to go into Mysia, and he tried to go into Bithynia. Oh yes, in nine, I think it was 112 AD, my church history comes back to me at this moment, there was a, a work done in Bithynia, and the chap wrote to the governor and spoke of the work done in Bithynia. Paul wasn't the man to work in Bithynia. It wasn't God's time. God, he wasn't God's man for Bithynia, nor for Mysia. And then he comes down to the blue Aegean Sea between Asia and Greece. And he hears that man, a man of Macedonia, come over and help us. My curiosity said, I wonder did he actually meet the man of Macedonia? But he came over, and he came to the best place where prayer was wont to be made. And a woman who could have been saved, you read about Lydia's church, Thyatira, in the, in the opening of Revelation. Why not save her there? No, she had to come there to Philippi. And the prayer was there of women, prayer meeting of women. And uh, there was Lydia. And God brought the, the reluctant preacher. He, did, he wanted to go to Mysia. He wanted to go to Bithynia. It's only God who brought him over the sea into, into Greece. And that's how the work began in, in Europe, you see. And, and that's something it burned for. Now, here, he goes to the place that he was reluctant to go to in uh, Philippi. And a letter is written, inspired of God, in, uh, in, in Philippians, you see. This is my third and final one thing you'll see in a moment. He goes over the things that mattered to him. They were, they were not bad things. I'm reading from Philippians 3, verse 7. But what things were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. Now, have you ever come to that point in your life? 
what things which were gained to you. You count them lost for Christ. You'll never grow till you do that. You may have to take that back to your farm or you may have to take that back to your, your, your small hamlet or whatever. What things were gained to me I counted lost for Christ. And, and you see, they weren't sins. They were his background. Look in verse, um, in verse 5. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning uh, the zeal, persecuting the church. This is bad, of course. Touching the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. And he went further. And in verse 8, it goes considerably further. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss. You move on from what things were gained to me, I counted loss. And you give the whole lot over. But doubtless, I count all things but loss. Why can he, why does he move from what things to all things? Because he has a greater view of Christ. That demands what, how much we give to Christ, our view of Christ our knowledge of Christ. Notice that before it was, I count all things but loss, you see. What things were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. Just simply for Christ. No description of him other than just for Christ, the Messiah. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss. Listen, for the excellency. He's moved on, he's got a bigger view of Christ. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. You farmers know that. Dung. Don't, that's the word in the original. Don't try and make it sweet. Dung is dung. But count them but dung. That I may win Christ. He's at the end of his life. He's written a third of the New Testament. He's dying in Rome for the faith. And yet he says that I may win Christ. He, he's not he has a champion. He hasn't broken the tape and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. When I left Bible college, I spoke on those words, and a fellow far cleverer than me, probably the most outstanding student in Hebrew and Greek, Paul, 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 he said, what do you mean that, I might, that, he would, that Paul might know him? He, he knew him. He didn't know him yet by experience. And God uses the bitters of life as well as the sweet things of life to, to know him. To know him by experience. If I said this before, I'll say it again. We know much as much of life as we've experienced. We know as much of life as we've experienced. And we know as much of Christ as we experience. And you have to experience him in the darkness as well as in the light. I was walking with, to an officer's Christian Union Bible study, which stupidly was called Jolly Boys, near Westminster Chapel, near Buckingham Palace. And we were all in civvies, like I am today, couldn't see who were officers. We were all officers, but who were generals and um, air marshals, and like I was a flying officer. But a man of a, in grey, he wasn't striking, he stared at me. I was walking in the gutter. There were so many of us walking to this Bible study. And he looked at me and he said, if you'd be a holy man. He didn't know me and I don't know who he was to this day. Some of you think he was an angel. No, I, I, I think he wasn't too good looking for an angel. I think he was just a, a man. But he said, if you'd be a holy man, you'd be a lonely man. And as the path climbs upward, it gets narrower and there's only room enough for one. He didn't mean Jesus, he meant you and me, room enough for one. And that's it. And I sometimes find as I like, like Bunyan. Bunyan was walking up that hill in Bedfordshire. And that's why he got the idea in the Pilgrim's Progress of going up hill difficulty. My friend this afternoon, we're all as believers who are believers are going uphill difficulty. But look up. How beautiful is at the top. The beauty of heaven. That's Christianity. 
And that man talked, at 1956, when I was saved, I didn't understand what that bloke was saying. But I've come to understand it in the last three or four years, even this afternoon. But you see, where is this thing about Paul being like David or Mary, a person of one thing? Or here it is. In verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended that which thing, this, this one, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. And the, the good things, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You, you go for the tape. I used to run. You go for the tape. I've only run twice in my life. The first was when I was at Taunton School and the head boy of the school was the head of my house and he was an arrogant so-and-so. And I was secretly, I was a monitor, was secretly smoking away. And this was the team, the, the race to decide who was going to run in the school race. You know, every house had 60 boys and he said, he took his gym shoe off and he said, everybody behind Bassett, he said, gets this. And I thought, and he was in the team, I thought, you'll be behind me. I've never been so determined to run in my life. And I ran and I ran and I ran. And as we came in the school gates, there was only one person out of, there were 58 behind me. And only one, and I suddenly was made captain of running, it's another story. And when I got there, I collapsed, you see, because I was determined. That was humanly speaking, to press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of Jesus. And the only other time was with 150 people running when I was first in the Air Force training. We went for a run. And the physical training, the PTI, the physical training, lost his way. And we ran 12 miles around Manchester. No training, no weights and all that jazz. We just had to run. And I saw these five people in front of me. I thought, man, I'd better catch up and keep with them or else you'll get lost. And when we finished, the six of us finished together. And he, who are you? I'm the county champion of Surrey or Somerset or Les. And, and he went around them, but they're all champions. And he said, what about you, Bassett? Of course, Sardin said, I just kept up. I didn't want to get lost. And he looked at me <laughs> in the weirdest way. That's the only two occasions I've ever, ever run physically. But I'm a runner spiritually. I'm determined to press towards I don't want to die. And, you know, I feel so lovely to be with Jesus. I have no in a desire of that at the moment. So he may give me it later. You know, Spurgeon once was in Mentor in the south of France. And he didn't feel like going into lunch. And he went and sat on a seat. And a woman came along and recognized him. He said, Mr. Spurgeon, can I speak to you? And he said, what is your problem? And she said, death, death. But Spurgeon said this, the question is this, is it death or the act of dying? You ever thought of that? It's marvellous, isn't it? Is it death? None of us like the act of dying. None of us. It's in us because of sin. And he said, my dear, when you come to die, God will give you enough grace to die. I had a lady once who thought she was dying, my dear, a wonderful, godly woman. And Spurgeon's words came back. So I, I'm, not, I'm not dying because I'm not ready to die. I don't. He gives you the grace to live this afternoon. And when it comes to it, he gives you the grace. To, he never gave me the grace to die because it wasn't my time. Twice I died physically, but I wasn't. But did you see things? No, I saw nothing. I don't even remember it because I was out cold. But um, how wonderful this afternoon. Press. This one thing I do. It sounds a bit Irish. If you, excuse me, I've got some Irish in me. But it sounds it, it like two things. This one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward to those things which are before. I press toward the mark the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Roger Bannister was the first beat person to beat the four minute mile. And uh, he was put against, later, the other great runner of the world, John Landy, 
of Australia and they ran. And as they came round the last bend, Landy was winning. Landy was going to beat Bannister, who'd be beaten the four minute mile. But Landy made the gracious mistake of his career, of his life. He looked back. And as he looked back over his left shoulder, Bannister, like a rocket, went past his right shoulder. Don't look back. Press on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This one thing I do, become as never before, a man, a woman, of one thing. Let's pray. We prayed, Lord. We haven't gotten our prayer. Sir, we would see Jesus. And may we feel we've seen no man save Jesus this afternoon. Make us that man of one thing. For Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Have you ch chosen the last hymn? I've just, I've just gone to our dressing room on the open road. You can't stand there with everybody. All right. We, we will know it, and we know the tune too. What's the number? 398. So you hear that? 398 to, to finish this procession. Don't uh, remember someone last year didn't, was going back to home and stayed for the evening. Well, stay for the evening, we hope more will draw, and God may come down in a mighty way tonight. Um, 398. I'm pressing. On the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying, I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet, my feet on higher ground. 398. <laughs>
now may the amazing grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God that passeth knowledge, and the communion and power, reviving power, of the Holy Spirit, bless us, Lord, and, and bless the food that we're going to eat. May we have sweet fellowship with one another and sweeter fellowship with thyself. Amen. Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you here. Some have stopped and some have gone. And we've had two fresh people come in. Good to see you, ladies. Um, as I said this afternoon, all mobile phones now will be switched off. Switch up, stand up a bit, my wife's flapping her fingers. Speak up a bit, she says. <clears throat> Um, I'm just going to read three verses from, from uh, Ephesians for, before we start. The last three verses of chapter 3. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. And that's his power that's working in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Wonderful, wonderful scriptures, that is. Um, we'll start by singing hymn now, uh, 72, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. There's two of us that chose this. I asked the ladies what's, what hymn they want, and one of the ladies come up with this. I said, I've already got it on my sheet, actually. Love divine, all love's excelling, joy of earth, come down to heaven. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown.
I missed you up, no. I never saw you till we were saying good to Nan. And a good lady behind you have come in fresh tonight. Besides more being sorry about that. I didn't I'm not paying attention to my job, am I? <laughs> um, we'll come before the Lord in prayer now. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank thee once again that we can come and join in fellowship together. Thou knowest the wonderful time we had this afternoon with thy servant. How thou hast blessed him and blessed us and challenged us. And we thank thee for that, Lord. We thank thee for a challenge. We thank thee that the Spirit of God is moving in this meeting tonight. And we pray, Lord, that our hearts will be open and receptive to the, to the truth of God because we know that thy, thy Spirit is a Spirit of truth. He can't deal in anything else. And Lord, we need to get in line with truth. We do. If we want to go on with thee, we've got to get in line with thy spirit. And we thank thee for him that he comes and comes alongside, comes and dwells within us and comforts us and strengthens us, takes us through deep valleys, takes us over the high mountains. And we do pray, Lord, for each and every one of us. We know some have got struggles at this time. Some of not their, their health is not as well as it could be. But, Lord, we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. It's all right for that, for me saying that, and I'm fit and healthy. But we, when we're, we're not so well, it perhaps doesn't look so good on the picture. But, Lord, we ask thee to bless. We think of our nation, what an horrendous state that's in. A horrendous state, Lord, it's in. And it's because of their own doing. It's because of man's disobedient to the word of God. And what else can it bring? only sorrow and judgment. So bless now and be with us. Keep us covered by the blood of the Lamb in this meeting. Bind up any evil forces that would want to <coughs> come in and make their presence known. We just thank thee, Lord, that we can pray these prayers in and through the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <coughs> I'd just like to say thank you again to Brother Bassitia for coming. And Daniel, for his testimony this afternoon. And Isabel, behind here once again, keeps coming, keeps coming. Thank you, Isabel. And Chris, we're going to hear a word from him in a minute, pastor of the church. Uh, as I said this morning, afternoon, there's two offering boxes there. You're not obliged to put anything in it, but if you do want to, just help with our situations. The toilets are through there. There's a... Uh, Thank the, the food. There's a bit left for later on after Brother Bassett's finished. If you, if you want to have some, you're very welcome to stay and have some more. <clears throat> the back, there's tracts and books and things, all free. Just take whatever you want. And I just want to thank those people that have been so helpful this afternoon in the kitchen. Because some people have had rubber gloves on in the dishpan and taking things backwards and forwards. I just want to thank you for that. Amen. There's got to be people that wash feet, doesn't they? Get balls out. And we thank you for we thank you for them. Right then, Chris. Chris is the pastor of this church. And uh, he's just been to Romania, preaching and baptizing, and I think he's got something to show us now. Right, oh Chris. <laughs> oh, thank you for inviting me up for, to speak. <laughs> I'm quite nervous in my own church. <laughs> wow. Uh, what a privilege to be here. Uh, just read a scripture before we start. I always like to have the word. Um, from Romans chapter 2, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. It is the power of God for salvation to them that believe, to the Jew first and to the Gentile. The gospel is the power of God. And I've seen that over the years. Tremendous uh, work in Romania. And where do I start with Romania? I've been doing it since 1994. Uh, I really don't know where to go. Uh, present day, you think that God is done with you and he's finished and you've done your bit and it's time to move on. And God says, no, there's more. He always says there's more, doesn't he? You know, this church itself on the mission that we've set up over the years. And so it's like a little satellite one. So we get send our aid there, it goes to there, and they go out to about 15, 16 villages with clothes, aid, 
mission and, and the gospel. Some of these you can't go in. They're so violent and so, so aggressive. You know, they, you just can't go near them. Uh, but in time, we believe we can. And um, this tent was taken. It was wonderfully supplied by God. Uh, again, God provides when we ask. And he provided us with this tent. We took it over. And I'd like to just show you what's happening today with a video clip that God is faithful. First of all, he's faithful to us. He shows us that. We get confidence in him. We know that he loves us. We know that the gospel is powerful. We know that we can rely on him. And therefore, we step out in faith. You know, I used to drive that van. Remember how I was? Yeah. Terror crippled. I've had three, three, hip, so three hip replacements I've had since I've been going. And I used to push the, the clutch in with the walking stick. That's how determined I was to go when God had dealt with my heart. I knew that he loved me. And I said, anything, I'll do anything for you, Lord. And so we used to drive, even one, once with my eye out here, I've been hit with a stick in the eye and I couldn't see. So, you know, when God touches your heart, he touches it. I was determined to go. And then over the years, this is what, where we're at today. And hopefully this video will show you. Grace, my fears Hello! 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 <laughs> Baptised. Scots preacher, cracky word there. Got capacity crowd in. Fabulous. So God is blessing the work. And this is a good, fruitful witness. Look how many people there are. There's over 300 people in that tent. Even. What's the future? This work just keeps growing. We need to get that village over there. It's just over there. No, there's no 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 church over there and they just haven't got the resources to take the tent and the marquee across there because every time they do it's costing about a thousand pounds and so the resources are they need our support so we need uh, to make an appeal to the good people of the yeah. uk to help yeah, us because out this this would be we could do three or four villages and the impact would be massive that means that we could plant a church there that's the issue money's always the issue we shouldn't be in the kingdom you try to give it. This is excellent. When you see this many people coming here to come and witness this, it's fantastic. This is a good, massive testimony. You can see all the people around. You can see the work that's going on. Um, amazing, since 1994, everything is just so built up. And every year just changes. So we have to remain faithful and keep persevering and come every year. The cost is quite a lot, but it's worth it when you see all this happening. It's absolutely fantastic. We give God all the glory.
410. Nearer my God to thee, nearer to thee, even though it be the cross that raiseth me. Still all my song shall be, nearer my God to thee, nearer to thee. Stand and sing, please. something else shall we? Yeah. 407, Jesus lead me up the mountain, one same please. Bring me higher up the mountain. to you. Are you ready? The, 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 the mechanics, we know that your mechanics will work anyway, if there's anything like this afternoon. Let us just pray. We pray, gracious God, that I would come down into our midst. We need thee in a great way. Speak, Lord, in the stillness 
whilst we wait on thee, hush our hearts to listen in expectancy. Amen. Daniel and I, and no Sonny, we've been moved to hear of these churches of yours that have so few members and yet you remain faithful. But it doesn't matter how small your church is, we should always be seeking to break new ground. And that is the theme that God has given me for this second and closing meeting of our gathering together, to, to break uh, new ground. In the 15th chapter of the Epistle of Paul to the Romans, I've um, been greatly challenged in my own life and so relevant this afternoon. Um, in the 20th verse of that 15th chapter of Paul's letter to the church at Rome, he says this, Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation, but as is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. The, the theme in breaking new ground, the first is this, that we must strive, which means putting terrific effort, physically and mentally and spiritually, into preaching Christ where he is not named. And it doesn't matter how small your church is, you should be breaking uh, new ground. I was in the village for, for 14 years, and when I went there, there was about nine people. I'm not saying that to draw attention to myself, but God took me there in a most remarkable way, and I was there for 14 years, and I, I hoped, I've been quite happy to have gone to heaven from there, but I've gone to heaven via um, Leicester Junction, and uh, so I had to leave, and the people were furious because we, we were a family. I know that when I started at Melbourne Hall, um, over a hundred came up in the two buses. I've told some of you this before, and my wife went into the local street to see them off, and she just broke down and wept. And on those two buses, coaches, going probably towards a hundred miles, back to Surrey where our church had been, nobody spoke. They were so, um, so upset. But Christ has used me to preach the gospel, as he did in that place there. Um, one, one summer, and I recommend this to you, I took my young people and we walked for miles. We walked to at least two, two villages where there was no church. And, and gave out leaflets as we do on a Tuesday night, Daniel and myself, you've heard of that. But we broke new ground, uh, places that had never, never heard the gospel. And it was uh, quite remarkable. Uh, Barnes Wallace, the man, the famous man of the bouncing bomb, he lived in a very amazing road, and I took it upon me to, um, to go door to door up this huge road where he lived in we reach many people with the young people. I recommend that to you. Practical ways of breaking new ground. To, to go to villages. There must be villages. There must be hamlets that have never heard the gospel around here. And they haven't heard because you haven't gone. Uh, I'm not seeking to be... Uh, I'm seeking to be pertinent that we are to do so. You know, you, uh, when God... Um, worked at one point he he told me that we would new work he gave me um isaiah um and here in isaiah um 54 these uh, words are, are found so plainly there about breaking um, breaking new ground i didn't realize that these are the words that took william carey from leicester or leicestershire into India. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Um, break forth, 
into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst travel with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge, enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth there thy curtains of thy habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords. Yes, you lengthen them, but also you strengthen the stakes, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thou shalt inherit, thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, and forget not the shame and thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth and shall not remember the reproach of thy wid widowhood anymore. And, and those words were given and we were able to enlarge the church by about 40 seats. But he said to me that this would be a work in another village. And, and we went and took over a, a desolate church building and it's a thriving church today. We were able to reproduce. Remember the church, your church, your chapel, is a reproductive organism. The church reproduces itself. And therefore, it's amazing that we should be striving to preach Christ where he's not named. And you know those wonderful words in the Gospel of, of Matthew. If you turn to, to Matthew... You, you find here, let me put my finger on the button, on the um, ninth chapter, yes, the ninth chapter of Matthew. It's so relevant to all of us. I read from verse 35 of Matthew 9, with this idea, striving to preach where Christ is not named. And Jesus went about all the cities. You know, we have, oh, he's a city evangelist. Well, that's a city church. No, he made no distinction because the, the people in the cities and the villages are the same. They won't be necessarily of the same profession, but they'll be sinners needing Christ. And we should be concerned for everywhere. And Jesus went about, notice what it says, all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. You know, he doesn't always do that, but you know when I was in, uh, in India the last time, the, the head man of another village came and knelt down in front of me and sought the Lord for his salvation. And the next day he brought his whole family and he had a blind granddaughter and he, it was his faith, not mine. He said, will you pray that she'll receive her sight? Or did you say, oh, that went out in the New Testament dispensation, healing and all that sort of things? People say the gift of evangelists isn't for today. And I say, how cruel of God then. He tells us to evangelize the world and takes away the gift of evangelists. Well, that would be stupid. And God is omniscient. He knows everything. He's perfect. And we need to get back there again, you see. And that I prayed, and that little girl, um, Sophia Angel, her name was Wise Angel. She, she has total sight restored. Now, God doesn't heal us all, but God hasn't changed. And you know, when revival comes, we will see this again, as one seen in India. I've seen several people, person near, one day they took me through the darkness, and. I'm human, and I thought, wherever am I going? Nobody was with me, just these people taking me. And there was a man dying. He wasn't dead, but he was as near as dead. And they said, pray that he'll be raised up again. And God gave me the prayer. And, and when I used to go through the village, this man used to point at me and tell his friends, because it wasn't me, but I was in the end of God. Don't put limits on God. He doesn't heal everybody, but he always blesses. And it's wonderful here, Jesus went about all the cities, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. 
But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. It, the disciples weren't. It says not they, they were with him, but it says he, when he saw the multitudes, I think the others just saw statistics. There's a book called Operation World, I'm sure it's very impressive, but it doesn't move me personally. It's just statistics. Statistics don't move souls. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them. It means he was moved to the depth of his being. Because they fainted. And we heard this afternoon, men ought always to pray and not to faint. If we could see people through the eyes of Jesus, that's it, vision, is to see people through the eyes of Jesus. And compassion is to love the lost with the heart of Jesus. He's given us his eyes, his vision. And he's given us his compassion. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he to his disciples, he didn't tell them to go immediately reach them. He said, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest and he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, if you pray that prayer, as I pray you will, you must not be surprised if he calls you, in some measure, to go into the villages where you are and to spread the gospel. We're not all preachers, but we're all witnesses. And you've received power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in your Jerusalem, the place where you are, and Judea, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. It's wonderful to me that God doesn't only say you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Ju Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria but unto the utmost parts of you. But he's also prayed that. If you look at the second psalm, that messianic psalm, he says, ask of me, as prayer, ask of me and I will give thee the heathen in these villages for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. It's wonderful. We cannot preach to the uttermost parts. We have need visas, there's barricades, there's rules that we can't break through, humanly speaking. But on your knees, you can reach the whole world for God. I say this to God's glory. For some reason, years ago, I began to pray for Siberia. What a pl I don't know why. I can't say I had any contact with Siberia. I didn't know anybody in Siberia. I'd heard nobody preach from Siberia. And I was in Romania my first time. And a man sitting on the platform with me got up and he said, I'm from Siberia. And he spoke of the work of God that had been done. And I humbly thought that he heard my prayers. And you know, we'll see people in heaven who were saved by your prayers in this place, in Leek or whatever village you come from. Or oh, we can't go and preach the uttermost. There are rules and regulations that prevent us. But you can reach on your knees or standing on your feet praying. You can reach the whole world for God. That is true. You can ask of me and I will give you the, her the heathen, the heathen, the whole lot, for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth thy possession. <coughs> the chapter headings were not inspired, not even in the authorised version. They get in the way often. And they do here. The end of chapter 9. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth labourers into his, into his harvest. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. It's wonderful here that the same word is used to send forth laborers. In the Greek, it's ekbalo. The same word is used to thrust forth laborers as to cast out devils. Isn't that wonderful? Same power. The same power that thrusts us into these villages is the same power that can call out devils. Same word, same power, same God. Oh, don't put limits, as we heard this afternoon, upon Almighty God. But you have to see here, if you're willing to pray for the labourers, we must be willing to be used by God in a small way or a large way, in his way, to reach people now. 
Are you breaking new ground or you say, well, we're stuck in Leek or where it is, you know, and that's it. What about the other villages? Do you ever go to them? Do you ever take people there? Why not have a meeting in a home, your home, or in a farm, and invite the people? <coughs> I used to go with my young people from Horsley and from Leicester. We used to go into many parts of England. And uh, uh, I remember in Newcastle, the elders were very much here. We had an all-night prayer meeting once. We used to go for a week, and we always had an all-night prayer meeting. I mean an all-night prayer meeting. We would work amongst the children in the day. We'd vi visit the people in the villages in the afternoon. We'd preach in the evening. And then at 10 o'clock, we'd go to prayer. And we'd pray to 6 in the morning. We'd pray for 8 hours. Sometimes there were not even 8 people. What has happened to us? You don't have to go back to Maya. And you don't even have to go back to the time of the apostles. God is the same. I believe there's nothing that God cannot do. Don't limit God or try to by your unbelief. The future, do you remember when Adran Naram Judson was in Burma? Things were terrible. Everything was so dark, maybe like where you are. And the little Burmese popped up and he said, Mr. Judson, how bright is the future? And it was dreadful. <coughs> Excuse me, he couldn't, he couldn't lie. He was a man of God, a minister of God, a missionary. And he paused and he gave this answer. The future is as bright as the promises of God. Was he right? Is he still right? You know, the history of the Bible, I tell you, what's left in the Bible are the unfulfilled promises of God. It says in my Bible, when 9-11 happened, we had a service with hundreds of people in Melbourne Hall. Muslims were there, the Lord Mayor was there. And I preached on Matthew 24. You know, it talked about the end of the world and wars and rumours of wars and pestilences. And that isn't it. Those things are not going to bring the end of the world, whatever view of the second coming you have. No, no. The love of many shall wax cold. Yes, that's terrible. And that's true in our churches, isn't it? And some have lost the love they had. And some have never loved him well. He says, because of iniquity, the love of many shall wax cold. But this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all nations. And he who endures to the end shall be saved. And both are true. Individually, we shall endure to the end and we shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all nations. It's wonderful. You know, whatever view of the second coming, I've got it right. Hey, that's a bit pro. No, because God has. What is the end sign of the end of the world? The preaching of the gospel. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So, in your villages, in seeking to break new ground, what an amazing word this evening. You won't be able to say, oh, it's for someone else, somebody else, not me, you know. Some of them has offered this thing of going into the lion's den and one of these, these circuses and trying to sort out the lion. And this chap said, somebody else, not me. And that's terribly true in the church. And, oh, I haven't got the ability. No, nor have I. But God has. Have we not heard now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in unto him be glory in the church, world without end, although he knew that, the now of God, that this is the best time we've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. And here we are to break new ground, otherwise we're finished. Looking at you this afternoon, there are few, fewer people here than were here last year because some have gone to glory or they're too ill to come. And I may not be here next year, and you may not be here. This meeting is so vital. I thrilled to come, and no doubt Daniel does. I'm sure Sonny's experienced that. But we need that. We need to strive to preach the gospel where he is not named. And so often churches on one side of the road and down the other, looking down each other's throat, as it were. We need to break new ground. We need to make efforts to do that.
to take our people. Uh, I walk with my dog so many, a mile or two every day, and since my heart attack, I find walking hard, but, but I learn that. And I find that I get opportunities to preach the gospel. And so, firstly, we've got to, to break new ground, we've got to strive as it says in Romans 15, returning there to preach the gospel where Christ is, is not named. And it's wonderful here that Paul also says we are to strive to pray together. Look at um, Romans 15 again and verse 30. Now I, I beseech you therefore for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit. It's an unusual experience, that an expression, that. The love of the Spirit. And so he says that um, you strive together with me. We ought to be able to say that to one another. And like the pastor has spoken, we ought to be able to say that to our people. Look at those words at the end of Romans uh, uh, 15 and uh, verse 30. And strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. And that was service which I have for Jerusalem and be accepted of the saints that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may we with you be refreshed, you know. I love those words, I think they're in Acts 3.19. Be converted, he's talking to Christians. Be oh, converted, no, 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 be turned back. You can mean that. Be turned back, dear people, this evening. Be converted that your sins may be blotted out and the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So often we look at our little numbers and our fading numbers and our fading health, and, but God is still God. Remember those who have spoken unto the word of God in your villages. Even here this evening, remember what I'm preaching, what Daniel said, and our other brother, because we will never pass this, this way again, how wonderful. Times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And what a wonderful thing to know a revival, a time of refreshing. These are the two thrusts and of the message that God has given me. Strive to preach in verse 30, in verse 20, Romans 15, 20. So have I strive to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I shall build upon another man's foundation. And look together. Our prayer meetings, our preaching would be different. How wonderful here. That you, at the end of verse 30 of Romans 15, you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Oh, that we would pray for one another. Surely the Lord can do a wonderful work. Um, John um, Moss, he mentioned that scripture, now unto him who is able, and it was in my, my heart to bring it. I once had to speak in London to an organisation dealing with drug addicts. There was a time in my ministry I had many drug addicts and saw them converted. And uh, there were people of all different, different backgrounds. And in this conference I spoke to people dealing with drug addicts and I spoke on what I call a paean of praise at the end of Ephesians 3. Now unto God, who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church throughout all ages, including this age, all ages. God isn't different. To every age. And that's the most amazing thing. And I called it the doctrine of divine ability. He is able. What do we sing? He is able. Doubt no more. How terrible to be doubters. 
How terrible to have some wrong idea of scripture that what God did in the first century and as we've heard in the 18th century through Whitfield and Wesley, he can't do today. We might as well pack up. We might as well close meetings like that. But he is able. It is the doctrine of divine ability, you see, and, and it's wonderful. I'm persuaded that he is able, you see, to continue that work that he's begun in me. He's able to, to lift up your work in that village again. You know, that's something very, very wonderful. You know, somebody described the ideal church. Oh, describe the ideal church. Perhaps we can make my little village church an ideal. I tell you, isn't it not in Matthew 18? But two or three are met together in my name. You see, and there they have the petitions they ask of God. The most ideal church is two or three people. I think then there's no room for standing passengers. Everybody's involved. So there's a blessing really, and I was thinking this, it's not off my head, I was thinking today, I think rather than one church with 150 people, which was something like my first village church, it's better to have 150 churches with, with, with we have to have 50 churches rather, with three people. 50 churches, three people can do far more under God than one church with 150 people. You know, we, God doesn't number like we do, you see. We, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. You, you can't constrain God. You can't limit God. And he could break in at this moment and we wouldn't be able to go home. And it may be that when you go home today, you say, oh, there were nice meetings and nice people and all that's true. But what difference has it made to your life? We should grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. I have no desire to go to heaven. I have no desire to go to heaven. Yet, there's too much to do here. And there's too few to do it. Think of us in our large church, just two people going on the street, you see. Now, I'm not saying that everybody in the church is called to do that. But what are we doing for God? Are we striving to preach or to witness for him? Are we striving to pray together? It's, it's a great word. It means effort. It means giving up your life for that, you see. And uh, will you be missed? When you go, some have gone to glory. Will you be missed? It's not drawing attention to ourselves, but there will be some in our churches because they preached and they and they prayed in such a way that we miss their presence. <coughs> Excuse me. We miss their preaching. We miss their praying. Oh, may God do a new, a new thing amongst us. I, I feel to plead with God for us all now. Let us pray. Oh, great, great God, I have nothing more to say. Thou hast enabled me to say something. But I pray that the words of thyself of striving to preach and striving to pray may break out amongst us, Lord. Help us to see the lost through your eyes, dear Lord. Fainting. Lord, fainting without thee. Without a shepherd. Without hope. Oh God, break in again, dear Lord. Jesus, stand among us in thy risen power. I think of these words we heard about, I am Jesus, to uh, Saul on the Damascus road, but I hear, think of this. The Lord Jesus Christ was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Use these feeble words, the stammering tongue, 
to stir us up again, to preach and to pray and to witness and to live for God as we've never done before. The best is yet to come. The path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Amen. Right, uh, I've picked out Go Forth and Tell, Church of God Awake. We must be asleep. 270 years ago. Two, changed yeah, I've changed it again. Yeah. 270. 270. Go forth and tell, O Church of God Awake. God's saving news to all the nations take. Proclaim Christ Jesus, Saviour, Lord and King, that all the world his worthy praise may sing. Thank you. challenges, Lord, that we've heard through the lips of thy dear servant today. Yes. Lord, we pray that our lives would be different. As our pastor has already said, it's one thing to say we've been in a good meeting, but Lord, if it doesn't affect us, yes. if it doesn't change us, then what's the point? Mm. Lord, we just pray, Lord, that our faith would be turned into works. We thank you for the words that William Carey once said. As we've heard of today, Lord, the one who left Leicester to go to India. Expect great things from God. Yes. But do great things for, for God. God. Mm. Lord, we just pray today that we would leave this room different people. Lord, we pray that you would give us all a double portion of thy Holy Spirit to speak forth the wonders and the treasure <coughs> of the truth that is in thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
our King, the Prince of Peace, the King of Glory, and, and the Friend of Sinners. What a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. All of our sins and griefs to bear. And what a privilege it is to carry everything to him in prayer. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord, we lift our cries before thee tonight. Take us on our way, Lord, to our homes in safety. Lord, and in thy love and in fellowship with thee. Stay with us, Lord. Stay with us. Lord, we pray that we would not lose thy presence. Amen. We pray, Lord, that we would never grieve the Holy Spirit or quench the Holy Spirit, Lord, because of our sin. And because of our failings, Lord, stay with us. We know the difference, Lord, between thy presence, Lord, and when thy presence has left us. Go with us, Lord, even into tomorrow, thy day, the Lord's day. Yeah. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us a day, Lord, every week, Lord, where we can leave, Lord, the things of this life and, and worship and focus upon thee and, and upon thee alone. We thank you for the, the Sabbath day, that it's the day that the Lord has made. And we do rejoice in it, Lord, and we are glad in it. Lord, take us on our way now and continue to bless us, because we pray in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Daniel.